Thank you so much, Patrick. And it's a pleasure to be here on stage at the Chalmers in front of Max Sissidman, as I promised I would be in last year's remote session. So to, when we say next year in Göteborg, here we are together again, and that is a delightful uh, development in all of our lives. So I'm here to talk a little bit about software update. When I started writing this uh, talk, I, I was thinking about it in the terms of like, well, what does everybody need to know that they don't know already? And so I was like, started writing the talk, and I was like, software update, the missing manual, and then legal got involved, then decided that was a bad plan. There was somebody already using those titles. And so I decided, well, is this Discovery D2 electric boogaloo? And I didn't want to be that mean. And so I thought about it from the perspective of software update threat or menace, uh, because it's a frustrating part of all of our lives today. But that's not hopeful enough, especially when we start to think about the, the improvements that are available to us from declarative management. And so where we're going, where we've been, is a lot of what we need to understand. We need to understand the context of software update, how it works in our current environment, how we need to think about it going forward, and maybe some coping mechanisms that are non-medicinal and maybe not liquor. But, you know, as we think about things, we need to understand one topic first. How do macOS and iOS devices update in 2023. And to start here, I'm gonna talk about two key resources that every Mac admin needs to have as number one and number two on your bookmarks bar because they are incredibly important documents that tell you things you need to know in ways that you need to know them. The Apple Deploy Platform Deployment Guide is a regularly updated resource. I believe we are expecting a new version of this document any day now. Um, I was hoping it was going to be here by the time I was here, but this link goes to the most current version. This will take you to a geographically normed uh, version depending upon where you come from. So you will get the localized version here. Um, and the platform deployment guide is Apple's manual for its own operating systems for you the IT administrator and the systems admin. It is an incredibly valuable piece of knowledge uh, that you should consult regularly so that you understand what we're up against. The other piece that I want to talk about is the platform security guide. Apple's platform security guide gives you the deep, low-level knowledge that you need to understand how your systems operate in a secured environment and how you can trust that Apple is doing the right thing for you as an organization. So with these two key documents in, in, in sight, I will say that most of this presentation is written based upon that knowledge. And so I stand upon the shoulders of giants and I thank the Apple documentation teams for all of their hard work making this information readable, public, and really easy to digest. So as we start to think about software update, we need to work from a common vocabulary. An update is a minor update to the operating system. Mac OS 13.2.1 to 13.3. Mac OS 14 to 14.0.1. Those are minor updates. Meanwhile, an upgrade takes you from Mac OS 12 to 13, or Mac OS 12 to 14, or Mac OS 13 to 14. In addition, beginning in Mac OS 12.3 and later, the concept of an over-the-air update made the migration from iOS into macOS. This is an update that does not require the entire monolithic installer image, all 13 or 16 gigs of the individual update to complete the process of going from one version of macOS to another. In addition, we also have the Universal Mac Assistant update, which is that application-based updater that is available from the App Store, or available through tools like Mist, or the software update command line binary. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to use those, how to get those, and uh, how to think about them. They are different than the over-the-air updates because they do require admin rights to use. Over-the-air updates and over-the-air upgrades do not require admin access, they require disk ownership in order to use. So, the update process itself. There are a couple of ways to think about this. Here we have system settings on a Mac OS 13 device, and you can see that we're being offered a new version of the operating system here, and you get that lovely little red circle that annoys the heck out of me because I'm a completionist, and I really try to stay on top of those things, but sometimes you get the red circle and you have to go do a task. 
This is what it looks like to most of your end users who are aware of software update. They hate it less than you do, probably. In addition, there are ways to do this via mobile device management frameworks. And so here you can see a system that has an update available to it. This machine is running Mac OS 13.0.1. It was quite an old machine that we found lying around. And it last scanned for updates in late December of 2022, and it found an update to Mac OS Ventura 13.1. And so at this time, you know, your MDM can be in charge of sending updates to the device, provided that your MDM is capable of doing that task and provided that everything works. That's a lot of provideds in one statement, I apologize. It's not my fault this time. Um, in addition, you have an update process that's available to you via terminal. The software update, the venerable software update command that is available to you in the, in the terminal is available to help you install updates through an interactive terminal session onto a given device. And you can access a whole bunch of wonderful verbs by typing man software update into your terminal command to understand a little bit more about what you're going to see. You can list the updates. You can install the updates. You can do authenticated restarts to the device based on the session that you have. All of this gets you to the point where you have the bits to do an update. It doesn't get you through to the other side just yet. We need to talk about what happens next, because what happens next is the really cool part. So you have the bits. Now what? There is a personalization process that goes through every software update process. And this graphic provided from the Apple Platform Security Guide is very clear on what actually comes from the device and is sent to Apple, and what the device receives and stores from Apple as part of that update process. The device takes a measurement of its own self, delivers that to Apple, and that includes cryptographic measurements of the iBoot uh, uh, sector uh, and the kernel and the operating system image and the anti-replay value, which is associated with all of the protections that you need to trust in order to update macOS or iOS, and the ECID, which is the hardware-specific information for the individual iOS device or macOS device that you were about to update. In return, Apple processes those cryptographic measurements and sends you back a signed authorization response, which goes into memory. That signed authorization response contains a signature for the software that the operating system will expect during update, and it will contain an anti-replay value, which is based on that anti-replay value that was submitted to it. And in addition, you'll get a new ECID at the conclusion of that process. All of these things are here to protect that you have the right operating system for the right device at the right time. Apple states as part of the platform security guide, during upgrades and updates, and a connection is made to, Apple, uh, to the Apple installation authorization server, which includes a list of cryptographic measurements for each part of the installation bundle to be installed, and a random anti-replay value, the number once or nonce, uh, and the device's unique exclusive chip identification value. There is more information from the platform security guide. If you'd like to read that, it's a fascinating document on how the operating system updates itself. I'm going to pause real quick because you'll notice that all of these things require your device to be able to talk to Apple securely. And it's really important that you know what the rules of the road are for that piece of the operating system. I'm going to give you four values here. Four things that you need to understand in terms of talking, you're letting your devices talk over the network that you have to Apple. The first of these things is almost the most important. Actually, I think it is the most important. Don't attempt to inspect the TLS or SSL traffic to or from Apple. It is not for you. If you do not trust Apple, if you do not value, allow your devices to talk to Apple securely, may I suggest Linux might be good for you. Um, alternatively, Windows, but do you trust them anymore? Regardless, it is also very important not to block outbound connections to our friends at Apple. 
And usually that just means saying star.apple.com, although we'll talk a little bit more about this here in the bottom. You'll notice there's a QR code here. I'm quoting from Apple uh, uh, Knowledge Base article HT2000, or excuse me, 2160, um, which is use Apple products on enterprise networks. This document is only probably about 15 months old in terms of its public re uh, version. It has been updated often. Uh, it has been updated within the last two weeks, as a matter of fact, and contains a lot of instructions that you can provide to your network teams to provide them with good guidance from Apple that your systems can follow in these cases. In addition, if you have a proxy and you're using a proxy for good and decent reasons, okay, if you're using a proxy uh, within your environment, you need to make sure the traffic that traffic that is headed to or from Apple skips that proxy because for the exact same reasons that we were talking about before with TLS and NS cell inspection. You do not want to look at that traffic. That traffic is not for you. And peering into that traffic is a great way to invalidate that traffic. So in those cases, the other piece of this that's very valuable for you to be aware of is that content caching as part of the Mac OS operating system is a great way to preserve your bandwidth. It is a great way to make sure that you have all the update bits that you need. However, each individual device still has to retrieve those uh, cryptographic inform uh, information pieces that are based on its personalization for the individual device. So be aware of those kind of things. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful product called Reposado. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and it, it was a really great way to maintain a full copy of everything that, in, that was in Apple's software library and in the catalogs and make that available to your local environment. Since the release of Mac OS 10.15, four years ago, right? Four years ago? Four years ago. Um, that has not been available to us. And while it is sad to get rid of that 600 or 800 gigs worth of data on our networks and replace it with content caching, um, there are great ways to do content caching in macOS, and there are great ways to do it for really complex networks. So I would strongly recommend that folks go take a look at the Apple Platform Deployment Guide on properly deploying caching servers for your environment. We also need to talk about where we've been with the update process, because it's, again, very important that we contextualize what we're looking at here. In terms of what kind of features that we need to think about in the software update process and how it has changed over time, it's how the operating system has changed over time that is very valuable for us to understand. If the past is Prolog, we start with Mac OS El Capitan, 10, or it's OS 10, 10.11, uh, not Mac OS. Uh, it introduced the concept of system integrity protection, which is that some directories on disk are read-only without the special signing permissions that are provided only to Apple for Apple's usage. This was the first sign that things were changing within the software update world. In Mac OS 10.12, or I'm sorry, I keep saying this, this is OX, OS 10, 10.12, Sierra, introduces the concept of APFS, a new file system. First up only for solid state drives, eventually later ported, back ported to the uh, spinning rust that we all have in our environment still, despite our best efforts. Um, APFS has a number of improvements over the previous HFS Plus file system, and I will direct you to the talks of the very fine Mr. Uh, Mr. Rich Troughton uh, if you need to understand the difference between APFS and HFS Plus. As we think about the volume group structure that we have today, where there's a system volume and a data volume with user data and non-Apple applications, this is a big change for us. And that is introduced a little bit here with macOS 11, uh, which is actually macOS 11 and not a previous version of the operating system. It's still, uh, it's, it's no longer OS 10. Um, it, it locks down that system volume with a cryptographic seal. And that seal essentially allows for you to trust that uh, that oper operating system has not been tampered with in the intervening time. That even if you had managed to mount the read-only volume that contained the operating system and made changes to it, you could no longer trust that operating system because those changes had been made. That cryptographic seal had been broken, you could no longer actually get past that process. Beginning with Mac OS Big, uh, uh, Big Sur, booting is now accomplished by mounting a snapshot of the APFS volume. So you are not necessarily booted from the bits on disk, you are booted from a snapshot of those bits on disk at that time of personalization. You can trust that now. 
you have a sealed system volume to go with your data volume with all of the user read-write data that is available to you. All right, all right. We said we were going to talk about software update, not about the system volumes. So I'm going to stay on topic and move forward. In these cases where the system updates, you are going to take that sealed system volume, make a new snapshot, fill it full of the previous content, make the updates that you need to make, as des described by the software updater. And at the conclusion of that process, you get a new system volume snapshot that is signed, sealed, and locked out. There's more here in addition, because in addition to macOS on Apple Silicon, which is very, very straightforward, you also have the previous version that were based on Intel chips that also had Apple Silicon inside if you had a T2 chip or a T1 chip associated with the individual device. Those have versions of a smaller operating system called Bridge OS included on there. Somehow not named for me. I don't know what, the, what they were thinking. But in those cases, you also have to update Bridge OS to update Mac OS. The software update uh, uh, process for Intel systems is incredibly complex, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I do want to take a moment to applaud Apple's single best feature of Mac OS 12, which is erase all contents and settings. Can we have a round of applause for erase all contents and settings? As I have said publicly multiple times since then, the engineers associated with erase all contents and settings deserve a title bump, a raise, and a pony. So they have made our lives substantially easier by making it very, very straightforward to completely annihilate the previous occupant of a system and return it to a known good state without having to wipe out the disk, lay down a new image, possibly downloading it from the internet, and going to town. It's a five minute process that you can trust to work every time. So how does that go? What's our process here? In these environments, we have a sealed system volume and we have a data volume that's associated with all of the user data in, for the environment. The first step to that is removing the user data volume. And so the operating system, when it boots at that point, says, well, where's, where's, where's my data volume? I, I would like to have my data, please. I don't know what to do. And who remembers the blinking question mark? What happens at that point is we get a new user data volume and a place for non-Apple applications to live because everything that Apple provided to that machine lives in that protected snapshot that is sealed and, and, and checked at boot time to make sure that the integrity of the operating system is present. This process just takes away the, the parts of it that belong to someone else and chucks them in the bin. A brand new volume that's part of the Mac and Macintosh HD volume group is added, and that causes the system to go through Setup Assistant again, which means you go through your MDM enrollment process, which again lives in the user data and non-Apple applications partition, not necessarily associated with the operating system itself. This is a brand new system. It uses the same operating system as before, but the really important parts that belong to the person using the machine before are gone forever. We, part of the process of securing software updates is understanding the boot process for macOS. And again, our complicated Intel systems with a T2 chip and a, a core processor from Intel, the T2 boots first. That little piece of Apple Silicon that lives inside on the logic board that is responsible for the booting of the device starts up first. It validates the boot ROM and the bootloader. It looks at the kernel cache signature uh, on file. It validates the UEFI signature on file and then goes through the process of loading the EFI framework for running the rest of the device. At the point where the EFI framework is loaded, the Intel chip boots next. It takes a look at the boot.efi file, makes sure that it, value, that it matches what it was expecting, and at the conclusion of that process, boot.efi reviews the macOS signature, and if everything is good and if everything is just as it's supposed to be, the system keeps booting. If things were not as they were supposed to be, system goes into a hold state. Will not finish booting until the system has been revived. If you've ever had a T2 or a T1 macOS device go into a fugue state and refuse to boot, chances are something happened at that point. That process where the boot.efi process would not activate based on the macOS signature for the environment 
meant that it, everything needed to be repersonalized, oftentimes with a new version of the operating system downloaded and installed through a revive process that preserves the original data that's associated with it. In addition, those bridge OS updates that belong on the T2 chip, these are modified versions of Mac OS. They are modified versions of the rest of the pieces. It's very pared down. It only has one job, which is essentially make sure everything else is okay and that you can trust those processes. T2 processors, you know, upgrade like other Apple Silicon processors. And so they go through a process that looks a little bit more like this. This is the boot diagram from the Apple Platform Security Guide for an, a Mac with Apple Silicon. I strongly recommend that folks read all of the detail that's contained herein, but essentially the processes are the same you go through the process of validating that you are who you're supposed to be, that the signatures match what they're supposed to match, and then we take information from the secure enclave of the device in order to validate that things are how they're supposed to be. If they are not, halt, because your operating system has been tampered with and you should no longer trust it. These are all of the parts that Apple has, has made into a huge process that for the most part, works. Once you have the bits on the disk, and once the operating system kicks this process off, it just goes. That, friends, is a miracle. And it's a miracle that they do it by making it so trustable that you can trust that the Apple update that comes from Apple actually comes from Apple because of the TLS security that they're using in delivering those updates, the ways in which they sign those updates, the ways in which they go through those processes. Apple has gone through incredible lengths to make this a great experience for you. There's a little bit of the part that, that we'll get to in a minute that maybe is less than awesome. So now that we understand how operating systems update, and now that we understand how uh, the operating system gets installed and the cryptographic checks that happen, it's time to talk about managing software versions and other lies we tell ourselves. There are some requirements for doing software update. And I think that these are valuable for you to know. These are, are, are things that hold true and have held true for a while. You really need a mobile device manager to do anything interesting with software update. And you probably need more than just an MDM. However, I will also say that beginning with Mac OS 14 Sonoma and iOS 17, declarative device management is very helpful in this regard. So we need to talk about how MDM updates work. In this case, we have an MDM managed Mac, and we have your MDM on the right-hand side. This process starts by your MDM telling your Mac, please do a scan for OS updates. And the system will say, okay, sure, that sounds like fun. I'll do that. And you have to wait a little bit of time because it's, it's, it's not an instantaneous process. It's not like this is something that's kept on disk. This is as soon as you send the command schedule OS update scan, the system says, oh, right, I'm supposed to check for updates, and checks for updates, and so it gets back a dictionary. For, it goes and looks at the catalog from Apple and then has a dictionary full of updates. You then have to ask the device again, because, again, mobile device management is management over the UDP channel, right? Like, there is no constant communications channel prior to declarative device management being turned on. You have to ask the machine, hey, what updates have you got? And then you get back an array of updates as an MDM. You get a you know, big formatted list. This is what I have. This is what I know about these updates. And what do you want me to do about that? So at that point, the MDM can say a very important thing. Please install this specific update in this way. Which update? Which way are the two variables that we have? And at that point, we, 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 this is a little bit more like my son cleaning his room. He's 10. He's adorable. I love Charlie. Seven times out of 10, if you ask him to clean his room, he cleans his room. Everything's off the floor again. The mess is contained. Everything is great. The other three times, maybe he goes up and picks up a book. And quite frankly, as his dad, I can't be sad about that. If you want to pick up a book and read some good stuff, fantastic. Have at. If you want to play with Lego for a while, play with Lego for a while. That's great. What I really wanted you to do was clean your room. But you kind of get this response back from the individual device, which is, yeah, okay, whatever, I got you. And it kind of depends what, what state the machine's in at that point, what happens. So I want to share a brief moment of confusion that I experienced this past week when I asked one of my own devices, hey, what updates are, the, are available to you, Mr. Mac running 13.5.2? And so I went and looked in Jump Cloud, and I said, well, what updates do we have there? Well, we have macOS Sonoma 14.0, a major update. We also have macOS Sonoma 14.0, a minor update. 
And we have Mac OS Ventura 13.6, a minor update. So what happened? How did we get here? What was in the, dic what was in the results dictionary that caused this? And so, because I, I, I didn't understand it. Why would this be offered as a minor update if this was, in fact, a major update? Well, we went and looked at the uh, software catalog that came back, and this is what we got. We got a human-readable name that said it was Mac OS 14.0 with a version of 14.0, and an is major update of false. You sit on a throne of lies, Mac OS. This is the major update that is also available in the exact same update dictionary with a human-readable name of Mac OS Sonoma and a version of 14.0 and an is major OS update of true. We have located both the UMA installer and the OTA installer inside the environment, and we're presenting both to the system as an available update. I have some quibbles with this. I don't think that calling the flag is major OS update is now correct <laughs> because it's obviously not. It is, however, respected by all of the delay policy. We talked almost exclusively about macOS at this point, but everything that I've said about the boot process and how we update our systems applies just as equally to iOS. Everything we talked about with that MDM command structure also applies to iOS. So if we think about what's available today in mobile device management, the answer is I can send an update command to an unlocked supervised device and result in an updated device. Unlocked, supervised. Manually enrolled your iPads, no, no luck for you. User enrolled iPads, user enrolled iOS devices, no luck for you. But that's an important thing for you to understand. As we go into declarative, one of those checkboxes flips. You can send a declaration out to an, a, a manually enrolled iOS or iPadOS device and have it be forced to update. Imagine my immense surprise when that worked during the beta cycle and we got something for free as MDM developers that we were not expecting. It was a delightful day uh, and I put it on my calendar to remember next year and send the folks at Apple a nice treat. Um, because that was a really pleasant thing to find because supervised iOS devices are not most of our iOS devices. And having the option to be able to do this for any device enrolled or automated device enrolled device was pretty spectacular. In addition, there are multiple different verbs. We talked a little bit about which update, we didn't talk about how. There are six common opportunities here and I'm gonna talk about the common ones here. The default behavior is go and get the piece, download it on the device, try and install it. That is available to major and minor OS, uh, OS updates and upgrades. Download only is another perfectly fine way to go and cache the upgrade ahead of time and then send a secondary following command to install later. Install ASAP, my personal fave, is download to the device, prepare the update, make sure that you have all the right personalization processes done, and then give the user about 60 seconds to close whatever they were working on before you update right out from underneath them. <sighs> Install ASAP is a very good option for users who are, shall we say, a little bit troublesome in doing their updates in a timely fashion. However, I will also appreciate install later. Install later downloads the bits, does the preparation, and tells the user, hey, I'm gonna update for you tonight while you're sleeping. Install later is the kinder and gentler version of install ASAP. It has some challenges, especially if you have blocking applications. It does not always respect things the way that you want. Um, I, my general experience is that it's probably between 60 and 65% success rate on a given initial deployment. And then when it fails, you have to send it again in order for that personalization to be updated, in order for all of those pieces to be done. Uh, install later is the persistent assistant in getting these things wrapped. And then of course, there's every IT person's least favorite version of this, if only for its unpredictability and ability to generate a resume generating event. And that is install force restart. For you, when you absolutely, positively need to download that update to that device and force it to be completed. I do not recommend doing this to anyone who uses their system on a daily basis. Anyone. I'm not just talking about your CEO. I'm talking about every one of your coworkers. Do not use this version unless you have to. 
This one's really good for conference room machines, really good for labs, really good for other places. This is not good for one-to-one -one deployment. So please take that away. Be kind to your coworkers. It's how you get buy-in. So the other interesting piece about install later is that install later only works for minor updates. It does not work for major upgrades. If you are trying to go from 13 to 14 or 12 to 14 or 13 to 14, you cannot use install later. I'm not sure why. I'm sure there's a very good reason for this, but it is a known limitation. In addition, beginning with uh, you know, the, the uh, Mac OS 12, we get the ability to defer. Install uh, later can come with a number of deferrals that you provide. Um, that number is magical because it essentially allows you to defer that when they are prompted to update. They are not always prompted to update immediately. They are not always prompted at the same time. They are not always prompted every day. And so the actual number of deferrals that you are trying to send, if you are thinking, okay, cool, it's Monday, I'm gonna send an install later with five deferrals, that means by Sunday I should hopefully have a fully up-to-date fleet? No, that is not what that means. Unfortunately, it is not. Um, be aware that deferrals are a little bit slippery. And Eric, uh, I see you out there. You are giving an incredible talk on how to explain bootstrap tokens in 120 seconds, so I'm not going to. Um, instead, I'm just going to put this slide up here, say that the bootstrap tokens are magical. They look a little bit like that, and they are used by install later to unlock the system volume, and only the system volume, not the user data volume, during a quiet period to complete the macOS update. So we'll hear from more about, for, about the bootstrap token from Eric on Friday. All right, rapid security response. Who had high hopes for a rapid security response? Who here still has high hopes for a rapid security response? That is, um, that is not great, friends. So when is an update not an update? Uh, this was added to macOS with macOS 13 Ventura. It was used for the very first time on the 1st of May, 2023. Updates for rapid security response are styled as 13.3.1 space open paren a letter close paren, which means 13.3.1a, b, n, c, our favorite, least favorite update. Um, and rapid security response updates, in theory, can be removed by the end user if your MDM allows for, for that process. You are in the control of that as an IT administrator. You can say, don't even bother showing RSRs to my people. That is an option that you have as an MDM administrator. You can also say, show them that, but don't let the users take them off. Or you can say, show them the updates, but allow them to be uh, removed by the end user. And again, removal is in the hands of the user, not the MDM administrator. You cannot send an MDM command that says, take this update back. That is something that is a right that is only a given to the end user at that time. So we support uh, managing RSR updates with a profile, and you have control over what actually goes in there. So if we think about what is inside of an RSR update, it contains special updates for Safari or other Apple apps that are on iOS and macOS. These require a reboot in order to be fully functional, although Safari updates, if you quit Safari and restart, Safari will be fine, but the WebKit framework that is powering everything else that uses WebKit on the device will not. So reboots are in order. The good news is they're fast. They are very, very fast to install. We're talking two to three minutes in order to, uh, from start to completion. Uh, they are based on a Cryptex patch. You download the Cryptex, which then gets attached to the file system as a live patch over top of what came there before. And that's what allows them to be removed by the end user if they reboot their device after hitting the remove. So in this case, an RSR update in Jump Cloud looks a little bit like this. You'll see a 13.3.1 minor with a really funny long build name that ends in a letter this time. So that is kind of what you're looking at in the environment. And again, this is kind of what our policy looks like. We're saying you should allow uh, rapid security response uh, updates to be applied to systems. And generally, this is our default setting. We'll also let you prevent removal if you feel like you need to. So how do you think about these updates? These are ephemeral updates. Can you download 13.3.1a or b or c anymore? They're gone. 
They're out of the catalog. They do not exist because everything that was fixed in 13.3.1a, b, and c is then applied to 13.4 when 13.4 comes out. So here are the four limitations that I think you should consider about rapid security response. RSRs have limited utility, but when you need it, you need it. RSRs have a very limited lifespan, which is to say all of the updates are rolled into the next minor release, and as soon as that release is out, that build is gone forever. So once you, if you still have 13.3.1 systems out there, and 13.4 is out, and you get a new version of the operating system, if you want to patch that flaw, patch the operating system. Don't think about it to RSR your device. My also uh, understanding of RSRs are, is that they go through a different testing flow than the regular operating system updates. There is a limited test that is applied to these systems. We may have noticed that in production with 13.3.1a and b, which was very short-lived, and c, which came very shortly thereafter. Be aware of that. And that may be one of the things that counsels you as you decide whether or not your end users can remove them from the devices. In addition, there are very limited applications of RSRs. This only applies to non-kernel space changes. That means Safari and WebKit, the a contacts application, the calendar application. These are things that do not live in the kernel space of the operating system, so be aware of that. So here is a uh, security content for 13.4.1a. Apple has started publishing security content related to rapid security responses. They have not always done so, and the community, I hope, is what caused them to rethink that. But they are now publishing security information that are associated with 13.4.1.a. And you can see that there is a follow-on for 13.4.1c. You'll notice that B has no such number. It stopped existing. It was a very short-lived update. Um, and in fact, it was oftentimes not available to anyone. So Apple is now paying attention, and they are, causing, they're, they're, they are changing their environment based on that. All right. It's time for me to go shopping. Christmas is just two months away. Um, and I want to present my wish list for software update commands. And I want deadlines for install based on Apple release dates. I want, I want them to close the deferral escape paths. I really want update alerts triggered by MDM. You know, they should be con configurable in, in time and persistence. And oh, late breaking news, Worldwide Developers Conference 2023 has come around. And a lot of new information has, has come out. You will now notice in the what's new in managing Apple devices for 2023 talk, it says software update takes advantage of declarative device management and now allows IT administrators to enforce software updates to specific deadlines with improved transparency. This is where we all stand up and clap. Because this is what we've been asking for. <laughs> So how does DDM enforcement work? And here we're going to go with a slightly different configuration of devices and MDMs and things along those lines. On the left-hand side, we have a DDM-capable MDM server. In the center, we have a Mac OS 14 device and an iOS 17 device. And on the right-hand side, we have our friends at Apple. How this works is that the DDM-capable MDM server sends a configuration to the device. Inside that is a declaration that says, hey, do a thing, buy a time, and here's some data. It looks like this. As they have mentioned before, these configuration declarations are very, very simple. You will notice here at the top that we have a com.apple.configuration.softwareupdate.enforcement.specific declaration. It has an identifier, which in my case for our test MDM was just a string. Um, and there's payload. There's a payload that in this case which contains a details URL, which you can drive your users to. I, for one, chose Girl from Ipanema by Astrid Gilberto, um, because that song is exactly what you're thinking of when your software update. It's the Girl from Ipanema on the, on the Muzak and while your system updates. We're also going to give a target local date time, which in this case is October 5th at 6, at 6 p.m. local, or 1800 local, and a target version, 17.1, or a build number, which in this case I invented, of 21B530. And so at this point, the system is in charge of what happens next. You have declared to the system, here is a deadline and a version, take care of it puts the onus on the management framework on the device to do the job. 
And so on iOS, this is sort of what you see. In this case, I, I took a slide from uh, an early 17 beta where this was prompted by our install of a declaration. And in this case, it's automatically downloaded as in process. And I could choose that I could install it once it was downloaded. Or at the end, you can see that there's a, a piece about a managed update. And there's a whole bunch of data there. And that data goes with the, the declaration that we had sent. There's a required version information. There's a deadline for the update. There's a details URL with that info bubble that's in the upper right-hand corner. If you tap it, it opens Safari. You, or it, it, I'm sorry. In an earlier version of iOS, it actually did that in frame. Now I think it is Safari. But what you get at that spot is a, a web page that you can tell your people what's going to happen to their device and why you care as an admin and why you're enforcing this update. You get to choose what goes in there. If you don't specify a details URL, that's on you. You don't have to include it. It's an optional queue. On macOS, again, we have a different video. Um, and you know, here we can see a, a local date time of the 5th of October at 6 p.m. And we can say 14.1 and a build number of 23A350, which again is a made up build that does not exist. As was specified earlier, if you specify a target OS version, it will go to the most recent version of that. You can also use this to deploy specific versions of beta operating systems by specifying the target build version as well. So think about it from the perspective of you want to specify a target version and date, and if you need to specify a build, you can specify a build as well. You can use this to update your beta devices, which is great because we should all be on the latest beta at all times, right? <laughs> In these cases, you're going to see a new update available to you. It's a managed update up there. That this in, case, uh, in this case is macOS Sonoma 14 beta 2. And in this particular case, you understand what the required version is. We understand what the deadline is. And if you uh, click for more information, you get the drop-down sheet that drops you an organizational help URL, which will allow you to open that in Safari. And in this case, see the talking heads. So. In this case, when we have this environment, the systems go out and request the update. You didn't have to tell the, uh, the device to do that. It got a declaration and took matters into its own hands. It's like, for example, Charlie, uh, my son, would be very highly motivated to complete this task because he knows he has a deadline and he knows he needs to get that task done by that deadline. And so what happens when you ignore the alerts, right? Because we talked a little bit about the alerts a minute ago. In this case, this slide is from uh, the Worldwide Developers Conference video introducing this topic. And so you can see here daily updates from 30 days prior. I have updated these slides. Thank you so much for adding additional information to my presentation, my friends from Apple. Um, and prior to this, we had thought it was three days ahead of time, and the Do Not Disturb window was attached to the three-day value, not the one-day value. I have been corrected, and I know new things today. Beginning at 24 hours, these alerts ignore do not disturb, and they tell you every hour until you do the thing. That means, in theory, your people will have been notified every day for a while, even if, you know, maybe they had do not disturb on, and now they're in the 24-hour window. Once every hour, hey, hey, hey you, you got an update, do the thing. And in the last hour, you get them at 30, 20, and 10 minutes remaining. And also, those ignore do not disturb. And at the conclusion of that process, what happens if you've ignored every update? Oh, oh no. <laughs> Did I get on a forced update? Aha, we're back. All right. So what happens when you ignore that deadline and, and, and have that experience? You get a notice in the upper right hand. Your update to macOS 14.0 is past due. You can automatically install it in an hour, or it will be automatically installed in the next hour. If your user was on vacation and came back from Hawaii and they opened their laptop, they have an hour to get themselves in order before their machine updates itself. And at the conclusion of that process, it restarts itself, it goes off to the deadline, and there you go. On iOS, it's even better. On iOS, you open up system preference, system settings, or you just see this alert. Hey, you have an update that's past due. What's your option? Install now. <laughs> Thanks, it's been fun. Let's go to town. This is install ASAP, but for your iOS devices also. It's rad. So we have just talked about something that I'm really, really excited about and that I cannot show you works today. 
because we haven't been able to test it in production. I'm not hoping for 14.0.1 this week. I'm really not, because there's a lot of people out there uh, who might need to update and might have to step out of the conference. I'm hopeful. I was not hopeful three months ago. I'm hopeful now. The future looks good. We were able to test updates and deliver them over this process with a much higher success rate during our beta testing process for Mac OS 14. I am hopeful. Um, other details for using software updates, um, this must be a DDM capable management solution that can send this payload. Must be the DDM capable solution. The solution must also support the bootstrap token, which Eric is gonna tell you all about on Friday, and it's the most exciting thing ever. So I'm excited for that. I want 120 seconds, because I think I was gonna spend five minutes on it. I gotta get that tighter. Multiple versions can be specified in a configuration, each with their own deadline. Multiple configurations can be set, each with their own deadline. That is fantastic and terrifying. You're going to have to take good care of your declarations file to make sure that you aren't issuing like every version under the sun. Be judicious. Set the next version and the next version after that. But recognize that if you set an install of a, a, ver a future version on a date that that version isn't available, the operating system is not going to be happy with you. It's going to be a little confused. So maybe just specify the version you're hoping to get. So. Be aware of that. A lar apparently, it's up to 1,000 of those configurations are available. I don't recommend setting more than one or two. I just don't. So we were talking about my wish list earlier. Worldwide Developers Conference knocked out half of it. I am not joking when I say that Worldwide Developers Conference 2023 was the best conference for IT admins in a decade. We got so much good stuff this summer, and it's just starting to pay dividends. But I will say that I still want install later to apply to major updates or major upgrades. I would still like update alerts to be tr that are triggered by this process to be customizable in time and persistence. And I would love to spot problems in, that might result in recovery mode during the pre-flight and stop. Because we've seen a couple of those over the last year where there's an escape defect in the update process and you end up with a system that's not in great shape and ends up needing to go into recovery mode. We ought to prevent that from happening. So, I promised coping mechanisms. I've got six minutes and 40 seconds. We're gonna talk about two of them. We're gonna talk about Nudge, which, who here is using Nudge today? Do I need to explain Nudge to anybody here? I'll try for a quick second. Nudge is a launch daemon and a configuration and JSON file, as well as an application that lives on disk. It drives the user to do the, to, to do the needful to apply their own updates, which is what you want. It can take over the screen, it can be customized easily, and it's supported by a Jamf schema. So if you're a Jamf Pro customer, you can just specify the schema and deploy the application and you're off to the races. We use it as part of our patch management tooling. And we, allow, we, we actually use that to drive great experiences because the MDM commands are less great as it stands. There's also really great community support in, in uh, the Nudge channel on the Mac admin Slack. There's also Super, developed by Kevin White, and it's based on scripts in the IBM Notifier app. It requires API access for Jamf Pro, uh, and other MDMs may be supported in the future. I heard he was working with some others. Uh, we look forward to seeing that in the future. Uh, and combining notifications with API commands for scheduling OS updates. It's pretty darn effective. If you haven't looked at it, you should. I also want to talk about the so software update CLI that I talked about at the beginning. This is a tool that you have available to you. Don't do it. If you are reliant on software update, you are doing it, maybe not in an ideal fashion. I'm not going to say you're doing it wrong because that's more judgy than I feel like I need to be. But there are major limitations here. I also want to point out that as of Mac OS 13, it's a really bad idea to use sudo launch ctl kickstart k system forward slash com.apple.software update d. Don't do this programmatically, people, even if the system is hung. There are other ways to troubleshoot this problem rather than like taking down a daemon that might already be downloading the next version of the operating system that you told it to go get. So be judicious about these things. In addition, authenticated restarts will require a volume owner's credentials, so be aware. All right, we talked about my wish list. We've talked about a bunch of other things. 
I want to talk for a moment about feedback as an art. Feedback is something that Apple needs to justify engineering resources to fix your problem. Feedback is also a little bit like shouting into the void where you're not necessarily sure, or maybe you don't want to know if the void's going to shout back. But without your feedback in Apple's feedback system, your impact is not available to the product management teams, to the engineering managers, and to the people inside Apple who really care about getting this right. So who here has filed feedback in the last six months? That is about half of the hands. It should be every hand. If something bugs you, send feedback. If something doesn't work like you think it should, send feedback. If things are problematic or difficult to explain, send feedback, please. So let's talk about feedback for a second. From my perspective, you need to start from what you expected to happen. I sent an MDM off the software update command with install later with one deferral associated with it. I expected the system to complete that update in a timely fashion within 28 hours. What happened instead that was not expected was the system never updated. And here's the sysdiagnose from those systems because you're always sending sysdiagnosis as well. Uh, so please do those things. You also have to describe the time and effort savings that you wanted. I had to go back and check on that system I had to see if it updated. I had to go get a sysdiagnose from that system. I had to find out if the user was notified. I had to find out if the user was interfering with my process in any way. That was a huge amount of time and effort that you put into that as an admin to deal with something the operating system should just know how to do and do for you. You also have to provide examples in terms of your situations. I sent this. I sent the, you know, this dictionary of a command, this dictionary of a, of, a, of a process. I wanted the process to be smooth. I really enjoyed the ex user experience of having these all, things all happen. These were the things that I wanted as an admin. You also have to center yourself with the context of your organization. Why do you need to apply software updates? Cat's in the room. Cat can tell you all of the reasons why you need to patch to the latest version of the operating systems. You should come to her talk. And then, you know, maybe wear your brown pants that day, okay? Cool, thank you. Um, the other piece of information that's really important here is clarity. Do not bog these things down with emotion. Do not bog them down with details that are unnecessary. Talk about what happened, what you'd rather have happened, and why you need it. That proves value. Use the feedback system, it is there for you. I have bad news about like, understanding what happens in the after you hit the submit button. Because the answer is, you don't know. You have to learn to be okay with that. And I'm sad about that. I would love there to be more visibility into our feedback system. I would love to know how many other people are talking about the exact same thing that I'm talking about. We get a little bit more in feedback assistant every time. But socialize your problems. Talk to your peers. Use your peers to amplify your request. Hey, I was thinking about this the other day, and I was posting about this on the Mac and Min Slack. Find three friends who are going to do the exact same bug report as you with sysdiagnosis from their fleets, with reasonings that are specific to their environment. I need to keep my system up to date because I work for a fintech company, and my risk profile is very different than, a, than an education environment. I work for an MDM manufacturer, and my security profile is even higher than that. Use your, use your networks. Make friends here. This is one of the things I love about the Mac admins community is that we all make friends with each other, and we all talk, and we share knowledge, and we share pieces. So do those things. If you wanted to take some suggested topic areas, I would say MDM commands not being reliable, MDM command escapes are too easy, install later doesn't work with majors, and install leaders with deferrals are too unpredictable today. Most of these are in the past. We have to focus on what's going to be in the future. Our problem is we don't know yet. And with that, I've taken you through all of the things that are coming for Software Update and all of the things we've been. Thank you, Max Sissonman. This has been a delight. <laughs>